In 2012, a group of Christians here in Wilson County set out to ensure that nobody would ever freeze to death in our county during the cold winter months. They formed a ministry called Compassionate Hands, and the following year, they organized shelters within eight different churches. And then the year after that, 2014, our church joined in, and we opened our annex to house women on Saturday nights. And over the years, almost all of you have participated in this ministry in one way or another. This year, for the seventh winter, and it's hard to believe that many have gone by, for the seventh winter, we will again host and provide food and shelter to women. But on top of that, on three additional nights, we will also offer our facilities at the annex so that other churches may use those facilities but serve as host. It is a blessed ministry that we are providing with our facilities. In addition to providing shelter in the winter months, Compassionate Hands also offers meals throughout the year. And every couple of months or so, members of this congregation prepare food and serve about 35 women and men, either at the Compassionate Hands headquarters or over at First Methodist Church. Serving food to the hungry in the name of Jesus Christ is as old as the church itself. The Gospel according to Luke tells us the story of Jesus of Nazareth, beginning with the prophecy of his birth and ending with the account of his execution on the cross and his subsequent resurrection. The sequel to the Gospel of Luke, part two, is a book that we call Acts of the Apostles, or the Book of Acts, or just Acts. And this book tells the story of the emerging movement known as The Way, which was made up of the Christ followers. Today we call this the church. The first leaders of the Christian movement were the apostles themselves, those disciples who had been called by Jesus while he was still on this earth, but not Judas. And they were headquartered in Jerusalem and they were led by Simon Peter. Now at this time, the Christian movement was growing rapidly and the apostles were kept very busy organizing and administrating and preaching. And then there was an additional aspect of their ministry and that was to engage in acts of charity. As you will recall, chief among the commands that Jesus gave to us while he was still with us was the call to care for the needy, to shelter the homeless, to feed the hungry. These ideas were not new. Jesus certainly didn't invent them. If we go back to the Old Testament, to Psalm 82, there we find a wonderful summary of what would be Jesus' ethical foundation. In Psalm 82, we read, Give justice to the weak and the orphan. Maintain the right of the lowly and the destitute. Rescue the weak and the needy. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. Jesus instructs us to do all of these things. As the apostles oversaw their growing Christian movement, they too sought to fulfill Jesus' command to care for people, especially the widows. Why widows? Well, because widows were a vulnerable population. Unless a woman had wealth of her own, which was unlikely, 
or had a family to support her, a woman could easily become destitute when her husband died. So, the apostles, on top of their primary responsibilities, were attempting to care for the needy widows in Jerusalem. But they became overwhelmed by this task. In addition, they also became the subject of criticism. The non-Jews in Jerusalem accused the apostles of showing favoritism to the Jewish needy and ignoring their own people. As we find in our reading for today, the Hellenists complained against the Hebrews because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution of food. That was the, the complaint brought against the apostles. So, to rectify the situation, the apostles called all of the believers together. They're called disciples at this point. To call all the disciples together for basically what was a congregational meeting. And here at this meeting, they pointed out the difficulty of fulfilling their ordinary responsibilities plus caring for the needy. Now, almost all of your English Bibles translate the words of the apostles here as saying, it is not right that we should neglect the word of God in order to wait tables. This is what they said at that congregational meeting. It is not right that we neglect God's word to attend to tables. Now that translation, the one that we read, that one would lead us to believe that there's something wrong about the task of serving the needy. It's not. That is not what's going on. The people, the apostles, aren't complaining here, but they are arguing that waiting tables, that serving people is not really the best use of their resources. They should be preaching the gospel. They should be telling the world of Jesus Christ. After all, they knew Jesus personally. They had traveled with him. They had eaten with him. They had prayed with him. They need to share their story, and there is no one better qualified to do this than the apostles themselves. The old King James Version of the Bible, I think, really puts it best when it says, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. I love that. It is not reason. Well, in other words, it, it doesn't make sense that we should be using our energy doing this when there's so much more to do. So, the solution they proposed was quite simple. They instructed the congregation to select from themselves seven people to appoint to the task of serving. And the stipulations were that these people had to be of good standing within the community. They couldn't just pick someone from off the streets to do this. It had to be part of the community. And they had to be full of the spirit and wisdom. They had to have a spark of God within them. The apostles, in return, if they would call these folk, the apostle promised that they would then dedicate themselves to prayer and to serving the word of God. So the congregation, they were pleased with this solution. So they chose seven men and the apostles prayed over them and laid hands on them. And that seven was ordained to serve. What the apostles found to lack reason was waiting on tables. And that word for wait or attend that we have in our Bibles is the Greek word diakoneo. And it's from that word 
that we get our word deacon. A deacon is one who ministers by serving. They are literally waiters. According to the Presbyterian Book of Order, the ministry of deacon, as set forth in Scripture, is one of compassion, witness, and service. Sharing in the redeeming love of Jesus Christ for the poor, the hungry, the sick, the lost, the friendless, the oppressed, those burdened by unjust policies or structures, or anyone in distress. The role of the deacon is to show compassion for those in distress. Now, the deacons are a group of officers within our church, but they are one of our two groups of officers, and the other group is the elders. And the elders, or ruling elders as we call them now, the elders are those who are elected to serve as part of the session. And their job as session is to oversee the work of the church, or as the Book of Order describes, discernment of God's spirit and governance of God's people. So the session serves much as the apostles did in the early church, while the deacons serve much as the deacons did in the early church. The role of elder is referred to many times in the Old Testament and the New Testament. Elders are those who care for and guide their people. In this congregation, our elders are responsible for many things, finances, personnel, worship, buildings and grounds, Christian education, and more. The deacons, for the past couple of years now, now, they have not been as active as they have in the past, and partly that's due to COVID. We simply weren't doing the things as a church that typically involve the deacons. And while the session it can conduct its business virtually, the deacons cannot. They are a hands-on organization. But COVID's not the entire story behind the deacons um, over the past couple of years. And I, I will take responsibility for not bringing the necessary and needed leadership to the deacons in this time. And one of the challenges facing not just our deacons, but all deacons everywhere, is that there are no specific guidelines for their duties and responsibilities. Their role is fairly wide open. The Book of Order, as I said, leaves it at a ministry of compassion, witness, and service. And that can be interpreted in many ways. And deacons at different churches function in different ways. If you go to another Presbyterian church, the session operates pretty much like our session. The deacons may, do a, may be doing something completely different. At our last deacons meeting, I formed a deacons visioning committee to review the role of deacons in our church and to recommend changes. And that group has already gotten to work. And I am looking forward very much to where this work takes us. And so I ask that you please keep this committee and all our deacons in your prayers as they seek to discern the future of the diaconate at First Presbyterian Church. Keep them in your daily prayers. There's another committee I would like to also ask that you keep in your prayers, and that is our officer nominating committee. This seven-person committee is charged with selecting a slate of names to be placed in nomination for seats on the session and the diaconate. And this year will be especially challenging since there are several unexpired terms to fill on top of those officers whose terms will end in December. The task of the officer nominating committee 
is part of what we understand to be our call process. This committee is not just looking for warm bodies to fill positions. They are seeking to discern who at this point in time is called to be an elder or deacon. Who has that spark of God within them. So, if they call you, it is because through prayer and reflection, they feel that God is directing them to you. And so when they call you, I urge you to accept their call. Church, serving the church, it is a challenge. It is always a challenge, but it is also a joy. So as an elder or a deacon, you are doing ministry in the most literal sense. Finally, I want to invite all of you here to be deacons for a day. Not serving on our diaconate, but to be servers as they were in the book of Acts. This coming Saturday in our own congregation, we will gather not to serve meals, but to make them. And on Saturday at 9 a.m., we will hold our fourth food packaging event for the organization called Rise Against Hunger. And together, we intend to package 10,000 meals. And that number just boggles my mind that we are going to feed 10,000 people a meal. And to cover the cost of the supplies and shipping and administration, we needed to raise 35 cents per meal, a bargain meal if you ask me, uh, or we need to raise $3,500. But thanks to your heartfelt generosity, we surpassed that goal this week. And so far, you have donated 25% more than our target, $4,390, or $890 over what we were seeking. We've got the money, but we're not done. I need you Saturday to gather in the fellowship hall and put those meals together, to fill the bags with rice and vegetables, to put in that little spice packet, to seal, to measure, no, to measure, then to seal, that's right, <laughs> and pack it up in boxes and take it out to the truck. There's a place and a job for everyone. No one is too old or too young. And if you've done this before, I mean, you know how much fun it is. We gather in there and have a great time. There's even good music. And if for some reason you can't be here at 9, and UT doesn't play until 6.30 at night, so don't even try that excuse. If you can't be here right at 9, show up a little later, we'll have a hairnet for you. As Christ followers, we are called to do many things. Among them to teach, to preach, to serve. So may we always be open to the call of our Christ, no matter where it might lead us or where it might take us. Amen.